Well, hello everybody and welcome back to your favorite show on the internet, Raw Law Unfiltered with your favorite host of the DUI Guy Plus. Today we are going to be covering uh, one of the most unusual and unique motions I think I have ever covered in the history of not just this channel, but the history of the United States of America and the history of my career. Uh, this is not something that is very common. This is not something that happens very often. This is something extremely unusual. Well, what happened, you might ask? Let me tell you. Two years ago, a woman by the name of Karen Reed is accused of uh, murdering her boyfriend, a police officer, John O'Keefe III. <clears throat> the uh, cause of death is uh, allegedly uh, leaving him, you know, striking him with a car and leaving him alone in the cold to die. Well, the public has not been very happy, and an investigative reporter by the name of Aiden Kearney, also known as Turtle Boy, has been covering the case for the last couple of years, you know, 24 months or so. Well, the people of Norfolk County, uh, excuse me, of Norfolk, uh, 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 Massachusetts, uh, I, don't, I don't know which county it's in, but I know it's the city of Norfolk where this is all allegedly happened, just 30 minutes southwest of Boston, uh, have been very, very upset and up in arms about this whole thing. So uh, this has been uh, a developing story. And when I found out that the, the the prosecution, this was last Monday, okay, last Monday, March 25th, I think it was, 25th, the prosecution decided to file a motion that is basically stating, um, requesting the court, should say stating, requesting the court to remove the protesters from the confines of the uh, grounds of the courthouse. 500 foot buffer is what they're asking for. They're asking for a 500 foot buffer to basically not allow anybody within 500 feet of the courthouse to come and protest. We went over that motion. It's going to be actually in the description below just to make sure in case you were wondering uh, what the prosecution's motion was. Uh, it's going to be added right now. Prosecution's motion. Here we go. So that's been added. So you can see that if you want to watch the video, it's only 50 minutes long. I go over the prosecution's motion. I almost have a conniption because um, I I just couldn't believe. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't believe my eyes that this is a real thing, that a prosecution is actually asking affirmatively, actively, asking the court to create this buffer zone. Now, some new information has come to light since I made that video, which was last week on, um, I want to say, March 27th. That was Wednesday, so six days ago. I, I learned that the prosecution, excuse me, the judge, about 11 years ago in 2013, in another case, has granted a motion for a buffer zone, but that one was a little bit different. That one was filed by the defense. OK, the defense attorney asked for it. Now, that one, again, is a little bit different when you don't have the burden of proof and you're asking for the least uh, inhibiting, the least restricting means to make sure that your client gets a fair shake. I hate to say it, but it's not the same, uh, you know, not because I'm a criminal defense attorney. Uh, when the government asks for it, it's a lot more fishy and should be looked at with a lot more scrutiny than if when the defense files it, because the burden is on the prosecution to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt and every element of every offense beyond a reasonable doubt. If they fail to do so, if they fail to do so, well, then the verdict should be not guilty. But if the defense files a motion of similar nature, which is not the case here, uh, that is going to be a completely different scenario. And hey, Paul, by the way, shout out to Paul uh, Christophero. He's one of the people named in the complaint that we're not complaint, excuse me, the um, the motion we're about to read um, about Karen Reed. There he is, by the way, Paul Christophero. And so, um, oh, you can't see it on your screen. Let's scroll just a little bit more. There he is, Paul. Welcome. He's he's the one who uh, gave me a copy of this motion. So thank you again, Paul. Um, thank you to Lorena and uh, Tracy and Spicaza. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, Spicaza. 
uh, Lorena Jenkinson, Dana Stewart Leonard, and Paul Christophero. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Okay. So let's get down and dirty. Let's get into the meat of this motion. So this is Commonwealth versus Karen Reed, uh, Norfolk Court Department, uh, Norfolk Superior Court, docket number 2282, blah, blah, blah. Again, one of the most unusual headings I have ever read in my entire career. Uh, Citizens motion to intervene for the limited purpose of upholding and defending the First Amendment by opposing the Commonwealth's motion for a buffer zone and restraining signs or clothing that express a viewpoint about the trial. Why is this unique? Why is this important? It's important because these things don't normally happen. You have two parties here. You have the state or the Commonwealth in this case, because Massachusetts, kind of like Kentucky, is a Commonwealth. And you have Karen Reed. Those are the two parties, right? The government, the Justice Department arm of Norfolk, of Massachusetts, in Nor the city of Norfolk. And you have Karen Reed, the defendant in this case. These are citizens who are protesting or potentially could, should, and would be protesting on the outside of the courthouse are asking the court. They're intervening. I understand they pooled their money. They hired a gentleman by the name of um, Randaza, Randaza Legal Group of Randaza Legal Group. They hired a lawyer. They pooled their money in a collective effort, and they hired Randaza Law Group to represent them on this to intervene because they're saying, look, we personally have a vested interest in this case. That is unprecedented. That is unprecedented. As I just mentioned um, minutes ago, if you were on the Tornado Watch video that I just did with uh, with everybody, um, the key here is that, remember the, the TMZ, Morgan Tremaine that in, the, uh, in the, uh, the trial of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard? T remember TMZ guy, Morgan Tremaine, the one that <laughs> led to my, my famous face seen around the world? As shocked as I was, as he just obliterated Elaine out of the water, it was the most beautiful things I've ever seen. That was another very weird one. But there, it was just kind of like a very quick, Your Honor, we have a vested interest. You know, we're trying to intervene. The judge denied the motion, and Morgan Tremaine testified. I don't remember the exact merits of the motion, uh, you guys are free to to look this up on your own. But the thing is, here it's, um, well, let it speak for itself. This is a long one. So buckle up, hashtag buckle up, hashtag it's the law is coming for you. Introduction. Movements Tracy Ann Spicuzza, Lorena Jenkinson, Dana Stewart Leonard, and Paul Christophero are part of Concerned Free American Citizens who will be negatively affected by the relief the Commonwealth of Massachusetts seeks and wish to be heard before this honorable court render uh, before this honorable court, excuse me, renders its decision on that requested relief. The Commonwealth seeks to unconstitutionally infringe upon the right of the people to enjoy their full and robust rights under the First Amendment and Article 16 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, as amended by Article 77 of the amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution. The Commonwealth's desire to clamp down on criticism and dissent must not be given this court's imprimatur. That's a fancy word for don't give them what they want. Interveners have no intent to interfere with anyone, to obstruct anyone, nor to impede anyone. And by the way, if you have not seen the video of Tom's CPU, who live streamed for about three and a half hours in front of the prosecutor's office yesterday. Um, th it was beautiful. It was absolutely magical. Go check it out. Uh, they, they're they sending a message. They, they literally protested in front of the prosecutor's office. It was just absolutely glorious. Um, <clears throat> but they do intend to engage in core First Amendment activity, speech on a matter of public concern in a traditional public forum. This is going to become very important. Very important because the public forum here is outside the courthouse steps and around the area. The Commonwealth is not satisfied 
that it has unlimited power and resources that come from one party rule, unlimited ability to tax and a monopoly on violence. <laughs> that that's, that's colorful language. Power has become so intoxicating that the Commonwealth has, in the course of prosecuting this case, gone on an unchecked bender. Listen to this language. I'm in love. Uh, pursuing the additional prosecution of journalists and demonstrators alike. But, like any addiction, eventually even those who love the addict must stop enabling them. The Commonwealth wants this honorable court to feed its addiction by giving it the most constitutionally repugnant relief that can ever be fashioned, a prior restraint. Now, prior restraints, remember, those of you constitutional, constitution aficionados in the chat, um, must be balanced against what? The least equitable means of achieving its purpose, right? It's got to be narrowly tailored. You got to balance. Prior restraint must be balanced against um, public interest. What is the most narrowly tailored way to achieve its purpose? Interveners resist on their own behalf and on behalf of many others who fear further Commonwealth retaliation if they step forward. If the court does per not permit intervention, no one will advocate advocate for the rights of the people. These four brave patriots, and there's an asterisk here, this word is not used lightly, given the way that the Commonwealth has retaliated against other citizens for challenging its authoritarianism, it truly did take bravery for them to step forward. The Commonwealth's actions in arresting journalists, turtle boy, cough, cough, turtle boy, cough, cough, and demonstrators, I understand this has been happening as well, who vocally disagreed with the prosecution have had strong chilling effects on the speech surrounding this trial. I remember some people in the chat were saying Massachusetts where free speech goes to die. And that is terrifying to think about. These four brave patriots have come forward to do so, not only on their own behalf, but as proxies for anyone who wishes to keep freedom intact in Norfolk County. Two, the court should allow movements to intervene. The court should grant this motion to intervene and consider movements opposition to the relief the Commonwealth has asked for. So why is this important? It's important because um, the court is under no obligation to grant the movements uh, motion to intervene, the four patriots, as the motion states, because they are, like I said, there are not parties to this case. There are only two parties. The state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Karen Reed. She's the one being prosecuted for the murder of John O'Keefe III. And meanwhile, the uh, the government simply has... Th these are the two parties. These movements are not parties to the case, you see? So they have to literally ask, please allow us to intervene before the judge will rule on the motion. Because the judge can simply say, no, I'm, I'm not allowing you to intervene. Goodbye. Movements have standing. Uh, oh, so I'm sorry. The court should grant this motion to intervene and consider movements opposition to the relief the Commonwealth has asked for. The movements have standing. You have to have standing. Standing is a fancy word for, you'll see. Courts permit intervention in criminal matters by third parties when First Amendment rights are at stake and neither party is particularly suited to nor motivated to preserve those rights. See Commonwealth v. Clark, a Massachusetts case from 2000. The trial court granted the media entities' motion to intervene to seek reconsideration of the trial judge's order barring electronic media from the trial. Now, petitioners, in this case, seek to intervene for the limited purpose of being heard when the court considers the Commonwealth's motion to be heard on Thursday, by the way, April 4th, two days from now, uh, as of the recording of this video, as neither the Commonwealth nor the defense are in the position to adequately stand up for the rights of the affected citizens. The Commonwealth seeks to bind and gag Lady Liberty, oh, look at that colorful language, and must not be permitted to do so without opposition. Defendant Reed should not be asked to defend herself and the rights of 7 million Massachusetts citizens at the same time. Movements have standing to intervene relative to the Commonwealth's motion, because they intend to demonstrate outside the courthouse during the trial. It is the citizenry, not Ms. Reed, 
who would suffer the injuries inflicted by the requested relief. Non-parties may intervene in proceedings where they would otherwise suffer a substantial injury to a direct and certain violation of their rights. That comes from a case of uh, ISI Incorporated, uh, 2016 Massachusetts case. Movements intend to demonstrate by holding signs and wearing shirts with slogans on them. Now, movement Tracy Ann Spicuzza is aware of the history of this courthouse and the fact that Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeu Van Vanzetti, Vanzetti were wrongfully convicted here. It is her intent, <clears throat> excuse me, to hold a sign outside commemorating the injustice perpetrated upon them with a statement that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is not to be trusted. She wishes to do so outside the courthouse because she is aware that the press will be there <clears throat> and the public will pass by. And this is therefore where her demonstration will be most meaningful. She has not settled on the exact content of her signs that she will hold each day, but she intends to commemorate the injustice done to Sacco and Vanzetti and to draw parallels that she sees in this prosecution. She wishes to communicate that everyone deserves a fair trial and Sacco and Vanzetti did not get one, but Karen Reed should. Now, move to Lorena Jenkinson and Dana Stewart Leonard wish for the public to focus on how this trial is conducted, ensuring that the public is focused on it and they pay extra attention to it, even if the public cannot attend the trial themselves. Which, by the way, remember we talked about this. Even though the public cannot attend the trial themselves, who is the jury consist of? They are a segment of the public. So that is very, very important to remember. That there's no such thing as special jury school or jury college. You don't get a master's degree in juryism. You don't become a professional juror. Uh, the jury is the people. The people are the jury. The jury is a segment of the populace. Again, I feel I don't know why I feel compelled to 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 say this, but it's very important because it's so basic. When did we lose sight of it? I don't know. Summer Golden, thank you for being a member for 13 months. Welcome back to the channel. Um, <clears throat> Let's keep going. So these two move, uh, movements, uh, Jenkinson and Leonard, wish for the public to focus on how the trial is conducted, ensuring that the public is focused on it and pay attention to it, even if they cannot attend the trial themselves. They're aware that the press will be outside the courthouse, and they want the press to see what they have to say on their signs. Jenkinson particularly intends to criticize the police and the prosecutors in this case by holding up signs in support of the Canton Nine quote unquote, who were previously charged with witness intimidation for demonstrating about this case. Uh, movement Paul Christophero, who is in the chat right now, wishes to demonstrate to call attention to his belief that the Commonwealth, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, and the Canton Police are not to be trusted. He intends to hold up a sign that says, Free Turtle Boy, in support of the journalist Aidan Kearney, who we just talked about earlier in this video, who has been prosecuted for engaging in journalism pertaining to this case. He also intends to hold up a sign that says, Free Karen Reed, all capital letters. Movements do not ask for permission for these statements and these statements exclusively, but offer them as non-exclusive examples of the lawful speech they intend to engage in. They do not intend to, nor should they be permitted to, engage in legally obscene demonstration, nor true threats, nor incitement to violence, nor true fighting words to the extent that such doctrine still exists. And we have another asterisk. The fighting words doctrine from Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, United States Supreme Court case from 1942, is a derelict adrift on the sea of jurisprudence. David Hudson observed courts have reached maddeningly inconsistent results with respect to what fighting words are. Uh, the doctrine is born from a sexist notion that there are certain things a man's pride cannot endure hearing without resorting to fisticuffs. Chaplinsky is steeped in an outdated idea of toxic masculinity. Authoritarians frequently retreat to this toxically sourced doctrine as a last resort when what they really want to say is, Your Honor, gag our critics. Nevertheless, if there is to be a determination that certain statements are fighting words, quote unquote, these must be addressed after the words are used, not in a prior restraint. Let's continue. They should not be enjoined from other forms of demonstration as long as the demonstration is protected by the First Amendment and or Article 16 of 
the uh, Massachusetts Commonwealth's uh, uh, constitution. The Commonwealth requested relief would directly preclude the exercise of movement's freedom of speech under the First Amendment and Article 16, and therefore must be denied, or at least there is that language narrowly tailored. The Commonwealth asks this court to use a sledgehammer when a fine scalpel is the only tool it, sh it should wield. Now, this is very important. Basically, the Commonwealth is asking, look, we have a problem, Judge. Um, we have a problem. And the problem is this fly. We need to kill this fly. Here's a shotgun, Your Honor. Get rid of this fly. That's basically the equivalent, right? Or sledgehammer, as the attorney here uses. When you could just use a fly swatter, a much more narrowly tailored approach, such as, you know, stating um, what the law is, you know, the judge can still rule positively on this motion, simply narrowly tailor, you know, denying the 500 foot buffer, narrowly tailoring it to the law of Massachusetts, which is pretty much the law everywhere, that the protesters are not allowed to personally approach the jurors and talk to the jurors, harass the jurors, but they are allowed to simply stand there and peacefully protest. That would be a narrowly tailored decision, you see. Uh, that would allow the court to balance the equitable rights of the First Amendment rights of the citizenry of Massachusetts and also protecting the rights of Karen Reed and the government in the prosecution of this case. Do you see what I mean? So there is a, a fly swatter. That would be the fly swatter approach to get rid of the fly rather than the shotgun approach. Let's let's kill it and, and make a hole in the wall and that the government is suggesting. It doesn't make any sense. The shotgun sledgehammer approach doesn't make any sense. Number three, the court should deny the Commonwealth's motion. The Commonwealth seeks a 500-foot free speech buffer. The court should not grant what would amount to a prior restraint on free and fair disclosure, excuse me, fair discourse concerning this trial. Interveners implore this court to not sacrifice freedom at the altar of the Commonwealth's zeal. I love this attorney and, and whoever helped him write this motion. This is just gorgeous language, such colorful language. So patriotic, uh, patriotic. It's 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 making uh, uh, a a Jewish lawyer weep tears of patriotism. Trials are public events. Trials are public events, and this court should not allow the Commonwealth to keep the public from participating. The Supreme Court has recognized that public opinion in a fair and open trial is particularly important. The knowledge that every criminal trial is subject to contemporaneous review in the form of public opinion is an effective restraint on possible abuse of judicial power. Without publicity, all other checks are insufficient. In comparison of publicity, all other checks are of small account. By the way, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and um, join out as a member if you're so inclined, like Mr. Risky. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being uh, a member for a month. Hello, Larry, love from Wisconsin. What the hell, supporter, love you, bro. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you have questions, by the way, super chat this way, super chat, uh, and I will answer them at the end of this live. In this case, interveners take no position on whether judicial power has been used in an unrestrained or unchecked manner. The default position is that it has been used wisely with restraint and reverence for the Constitution, and the default presumption is that this court will continue to use it when evaluating the motion. The court should embrace demonstrators outside the courthouse. I love that. Courts wield an immense amount of authority because they are seen as legitimate checks on the power of other branches of government. Where a court may find itself checked by public opinion, it is more likely to be legitimized by wide open and robust debate. What better way for a court to show its confidence in the process than to pronounce that it has no fear of speech outside its walls? It should invite it. Now, what this opinion is actually not saying, by the way, mind you, if you've noticed, is that the very, very important piece, and we may get to it, we may not. I don't know how far the lawyer really wanted to take it, but you know, um, you it, there's a possibility of eroding public confidence in the trial 
and and the court system collectively if this judge grants the prosecution's motion carte blanche giving them the 500 foot buffer everything that they're asking for and uh, courts across the nation people across the nation will start losing faith in our judicial process i mean it, this could be the first domino to fall. We can never predict the future. We don't know how the people are going to react to things like this. You know, just because it happened in the past doesn't mean that if it keeps happening, people are just going to sit silently and go, okay, well, more rights of ours are being taken away. At some point, the people will react. The people will, I don't want to say revolt, but they might. You never know. You never know what the public is going to do as as the government keeps slowly chipping away at their rights taking away taking a little bit more taking a little bit more and taking a little bit more um right ruby that's i mean that's a very very important piece to this whole thing uh fraud wrangler what's up brother uh thank you for the five gifted by the way shout out in the chat if you got a gifted membership from fraud at wrangler what's up buddy good to see you man all right <clears throat> so back to the motion 3.2, the forums the Commonwealth seeks to regulate. The Commonwealth seeks to regulate two classes of turf, the courthouse and its curtilage inside the court's territory and outside the court's territory, traditional public forums such as public sidewalks. The Commonwealth's motion exceeds the reasonable restrictions to both classes. I agree. Interveners recognize that there is a lower level of tolerance for speech in the courthouse itself. Nevertheless, the court should still exercise restraint and wisdom when fashioning its remedies, even in the space where it has virtually unlimited authority. Let's talk about inside the courthouse. With respect to regulations inside the courthouse, Interveners have little quarrel. The court has near plenary authority to use its best judgment inside its own realm. Interveners do not take issue with the blanket nature of the request prior to speech occurring. The court is in a position to observe the conduct of the proceedings and it is able to judge at the time of the speech if it is disruptive or distracting. Should a member of the public sit inside the courtroom with a shirt that says free Karen Reed or a button that says justice or any other message and the court sees no disruption, then such should be permitted. With an asterisk, interveners intend to also rotate to seats inside the trial wearing such expressive apparel. The Commonwealth, and by the way, what I love about this is that, you know, the protesters are no holds barred. They're not trying to like play a bait and switch. Like we're going to do this and then you know what? Oh, we're also going to go inside the courtroom. They are li literally laying everything out. This is our plan of action, judge. We're going to be outside with our free Karen Reed signs and t-shirts. And then once the trial begins, we're going to migrate inside the trial and we're going to sit there with our free Karen Reed justice for John O'Keefe or whatever apparel. And we're going to be sitting inside the courtroom. They're not playing hide the ball. They are letting their freak flag fly. They are laying all their cards on the table, and that's very... The Commonwealth seeks a prior restraint when this court can observe the courtroom day to day and see for itself if either Reed's rights or the Commonwealth's interests could be impacted. The court should not bind itself and the public prior, the prior restraint, to seeing what will happen and how it might affect things, unless there is a restriction that is so obviously necessary that it should be pre-announced. Courtroom observers should be admonished to be silent. Holding up signs seems to be disruptive no matter what the message or even if the sign is a blank piece of paper. But limiting the messages that people can have on water bottles, the Commonwealth is going too far. One portion of the request is particularly calling out for caution. The Commonwealth has asked that law enforcement officers not be permitted to wear their uniforms inside the courtroom. The court should, prior to granting such a request, consider why the Commonwealth is asking for such a restriction and should consider the fact that the Commonwealth may be asking for this relief in order to send a message of its own. Oh, this is interesting. I did not think of this. The Commonwealth saying the police officers should not be wearing their um, uniforms inside the courtroom 
Maybe the Commonwealth may be asking for this relief in order to send a message of its own. What is the message? In most cases involving a fallen law enforcement officer, such in this case as John O'Keefe, courtrooms are packed with fellow officers in uniform supporting their fallen comrade. Here, despite this being a high-profile case about a fallen officer, the courtroom has been devoid of law enforcement officers in uniform. So already, already it has been devoid of that. So what the Commonwealth is asking for is a misnomer. They, they weren't planning on doing that anyway. And they're using the whole uh, no Karen, free Karen Reed signs. Okay, and we'll equally not do the same by having uniformed officers is a misnomer. It's a disguise. It's a lie. It's a fraud. Interesting. I did not think of that. The court should be mindful that the Commonwealth seems aware that this is a unique trial in which a fallen officer's alleged killer's trial is not being attended en masse by men and women in uniform. The court should be mindful that the lack of officers in uniform may communicate one thing if the room is void of them because they chose to remain at home. The court itself will create a second narrative if they weren't coming anyway, letting the Commonwealth blame the order for a lack of law enforcement attendance rather than an inability to attract supporters in blue. Oh my God, that is genius. Wow. This is also a clear and present danger in restrictions on the interveners. If members can wear shirts that read Sacco and, and Vanzetti's lives mattered in this courthouse, but not free Karen Reed, the court may be placing its imprimatur on some displays, but not others. Again, not narrowly tailored. To the extent that any restriction is placed on displays inside the courtroom, the court should pronounce that this is because the Commonwealth asked for the restriction or Ms. Reed asked for it if she asks for one. Otherwise, it may appear that observers in the courtroom are not communicating a message to anyone because they have chosen to remain silent, and choosing to remain silent is itself a viewpoint. It's like a reporter asking a person, uh, would you like to comment on this? No comment. That's a comment. That is a statement. That is a message. The court should temper any, quote-unquote, inside the courthouse relief with mindfulness towards how the Commonwealth may be manipulating this process on purpose or simply unwittingly, I think I'm leaning towards on purpose, but they're giving them the benefit of the doubt, which is, I think, being too gracious, but you have to sometimes, to enlist the court into using trial observers to present a narrative of its own. Wow, I want to read this part again because this is crazy. The court itself will create a second narrative if the, the, the boys and girls in blue weren't coming anyway, and now the Commonwealth can blame the judge's order. Well, we didn't have any law enforcement here because... You know, the court placed this order in place, not because the, John O'Keefe does not have the support of the boys and girls in blue, because that could be the defense's argument. Like, look, they're, clearly the government uh, is not here to support John O'Keefe, and they're not here, the, the, the boys and girls in blue are not sitting in the audience because they did it, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why they're not here to support him, because they're the ones who fucking killed him. <laughs> It doesn't get much simpler than this, folks. Um, outside the courthouse. The Commonwealth seeks an order prohibiting any individual from demonstrating in any manner, indicating carrying signs or posters or making statements about the defendant, law enforcement, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office, potential witnesses on or the evidence within 500 feet of the Norfolk Superior Court complex, which includes the parking area behind the Registry of Deeds building during the trial of this case. Such a request is not narrowly tailored and constitutionally infirm. From, quote unquote, time of, excuse me, from time out of mind, public streets and sidewalks have been used for public assembly and debate, the hallmarks of a traditional public forum. That's the United States Supreme Court of Frisbee versus Schultz, 1988, the year I was born, actually. The government's ability to limit expressive activity in the traditional public forum is sharply circumscribed. That is Perry Education Association case. Again, United States Supreme Court, 1983. 
In Grace, a 1983 United States Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court held that the sidewalks forming the perimeter of the Supreme Court grounds are traditional public forums, places where expressive activity is lightly regulated because they are indistinguishable from any other sidewalks in Washington, D.C. In other words, Congress tried to protect the Supreme Court from protests, and the Supreme Court itself <laughs> struck down Congress's attempt to do so. <laughs> if the Supreme Court can tolerate protests, I think this court can do so as well. <laughs> the Commonwealth seeks not only to regulate the sidewalks adjacent to court grounds, but also to the streets, sidewalks, buildings, and parks within a 500-foot distance from court grounds. This request is overbroad and not narrowly tailored to a compelling state interest. The court cannot justify banning all demonstrations within 500 feet of the courthouse unless it articulates a compelling governmental interest in doing so, and it does so in a narrowly tailored fashion. To do that, we must ask ourselves, what is the government interest? The Commonwealth's interest is to quash public displays of criticism. This is not a legitimate, let alone compelling government interest. Agreed. On the other hand, interveners accept that shielding the jury from contact that could unduly influence them is a compelling governmental interest. In order to meet the narrowly tailored prong of the analysis, the Commonwealth must target the exact wrong that it wants the court to cure. For example, see Frisbee. Or Ward, another in the United States Supreme Court case from 89, Casey the First Circuit case in, from 2002. Meanwhile, the Commonwealth just seeks to create a 500-foot-wide sledgehammer and crush all this favorite speech that it lands on. Come on. Shotgun approach does not work, folks. Does not work. This even includes private property, where the interveners have gathered in the past and intend to do so in the future. The Commonwealth seeks to create the illusion that there's no public outcry against how they've handled this case. Boom. That's it right there. They finally nail the truth on the Commonwealth's intent. Re I'm going to read this again. The Commonwealth seeks to create the illusion, or how about the delusion? That would be another great word. That there is no public outcry against how they have handled this case and how they have quashed dissent by prosecuting journalists and demonstrators alike. alike. This is madness. This is absolute madness. Scott McGinnis says, D.A. Morrissey wishes to dragnet the centers of his Reich and march them to boxcar trains. Oh, my God, the visual. Seeing this is not World War II Europe. Instead, he wages lawfare with his controlled judges in beholden courts. Thank you, Rudolf Stuart Hammerstrom, for the 36. And also, Scott McGinnis again says, Boston police officers have not been going to court because they know that their brother, Officer John O'Keefe, was not unalived by Karen Reed, but by somebody else within the system. That is a lie. Um, and people seem to be agreeing with Scott um, reading the chat. So the Commonwealth seeks to create the delusion that there's no public outry, outcry against how they handle this case and how they have quashed dissent by prosecuting journalists and demonstrators alike. What a powerful statement. I had to read it three times. I'm sorry, not sorry. The proposed restriction is not limited to this case. It means as inside the courthouse, citizens cannot demonstrate with phrases like back the blue or defund the police. It means one cannot campaign against the incumbent district attorney. It means that one cannot protest excesses by the Commonwealth, like charging other demonstrators or journalists with crimes. It means that one cannot engage in pamphleteering regarding jury nullification in general without targeting any particular case. For example, in Picard versus Megliano, a Second, Circuit Court, uh, a Second Circuit Court case from 2022 finding that such pamphleteering to be protected speech. It means that the homeowners and business owners and patrons, even inside the multitude of buildings within the proposed perimeter, cannot use their own property, implicating not only the First Amendment, but also the Fifth Amendment. A case of Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid, a 2021 Supreme Court case, said a regulatory taking imposes regulations that restrict a property's owner's ability to use his own property. It means that nearby employees cannot exercise their Section 7 rights and picket their employer in opposition to unfair labor practices, for example. If anything, a restriction can only apply to the courthouse grounds and to the particulars of this specific case. And even then, the tailoring must be even more narrow than that. So this brings us to narrow tailoring. The Commonwealth's proposal reflects no tailoring, let alone narrow tailoring. The Commonwealth wants to create a free speech desert 
500 feet in all directions from the courthouse. However, this court could readily craft narrower restrictions than this, which would target any imaginable legitimate concerns. For example, if the court were to uh, require a ban during jury selection only, this would still likely chafe the Constitution, but interveners would compromise and waive any challenge to such a limitation. During trial, the jury could be brought in through the back entrance to the courthouse, and demonstrators could be banned from that entrance. After all, the public does not generally pass by the back entrance to the courthouse, and the press will be out front. Any infringement on First Amendment rights from these narrowly tailored and limited remedies would be diminished enough that more zealous parties might uh, complain, but these interveners would not challenge them. These suggestions alone would tailor the relief so that the Constitution was not so obviously treated with such violence. God, I love this language. I absolutely love it. Interveners suggest the following narrow tailoring devices. Here we go. So now what we, we, we discussed what not to do, okay? We discussed what not to do. We discussed what, in this motion, what the uh, the protesters are saying, we don't want you to do this. Now, here come the suggestions of what we think the court should do. I agree, SDD. This is very well worded. Any restrictions on demonstrations should only be during jury selection. Interesting. When the prospective jurors will be entering through the main entrance and they cannot be instructed to enter through the alternate entrances. Very interesting that they are conceding this right here. I mean, I would even go so far as to allow it during jury selection, but I don't know. Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe I'm missing something. So any restrictions on demonstrations should only be during jury selection when they're entering through the main entrance. Okay, all right, so the protesters are conceding that. Any other concerns about tainting the jury or witness? Well, actually, you know what? I take it back. I, I think I understand why. I think I understand why. Okay, remember we did that poll the other day, uh, last week, like six days ago? It, it may just be an olive branch, says Ruby Chase. It might be, but it, I think it's more than just an olive branch. Think about it. If I'm a juror in this case, and I'm walking to the courthouse, I'm a prospective juror, I may be one of the 12 or 14, if there are a couple alternates to sit on this case, and I'm walking towards the courthouse and I see a bunch of like free Karen Reed, justice for John O'Keefe. I mean, I may just feel a little bit intimidated. I may feel a little like flushed. I may feel a little, um, you know, worried, like how is this going to affect the trial, and I mean, how deep is this? Uh, should I be scared for my own life? You know, that sort of thing. It's exactly, Lauren, that's exactly what I'm trying to say, to not intimidate any prospective jurors right there. So that might be the narrowly tailored component of the protesters' argument to allow the court to have a piece, essentially, to have a piece of it. Uh, the as we're walking towards the courthouse, there are, there's there are no protesters during jury selection. Jury selection only. Once the trial begins, I mean there are going to be protesters. The jurors are going to see them, but they're not going to be walking head into them. You see what I mean? That's a big difference. Gigi, thank you for joining on as a member. By the way, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, join on as a member. Membership started at ninety nine cents, and throw me any super chats if you have any questions about this. Um. So, number two, any other concerns about tainting the jury or witnesses should be limited to actual contact, I totally agree, with jurors or witnesses. Any concerns about demonstrators influencing them should be addressed by bringing jurors and witnesses in through alternate access points, agreed, where there may be reasonable buffer zones enacted. However, such buffer zones should be limited to 25 feet on either side of the rear entrance to the courthouse. I love that the lawyer and the protesters are uh, providing direct guidance to the judge in exchange for, you know, her denying the prosecution's motion upright, uh, outright, excuse me. 
if there is a specific finding that it is impossible for a juror or witness to enter the courthouse through the back entrance, perhaps then law enforcement may be called to require that demonstrators face away from the courthouse for a few seconds that it takes for a person to enter the courthouse, and then the demonstrators may continue unrestricted once that affected person has entered or exited the building. Again, this seems a little too complicated, but Okay. However, to prevent abuse of this narrowly tailored restriction, here we go, there should be a specific factual finding as to why it would be impossible to use the back door rather than the public facing the door to the courthouse. Fair enough. The Commonwealth is the one who should be restrained. 3.4. Demonstrators outside the courthouse are outside the jurisdiction of this court. However, the Commonwealth is not. And the Commonwealth, having opened this subject for discussion, <laughs> should have that discussion aimed at its conduct to date and its conduct going forward. The Commonwealth claims that it, too, has a right to a fair trial. It claims to citing dicta. There's an asterisk here. The Commonwealth cites a throwaway line in a case involving a trial judge abusing his discretion by dismissing a criminal case right after opening statements. And while the SJC may have used this troubling phrase more than once. It is hardly a quote unquote right that would coextensive that would be coextensive with the fifth, sixth, or fourteenth amendment, nor is it a quote unquote right that should render the first amendment a mere afterthought. So it claims so, citing dicta, and seems to miss the entire point of the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. The government does not have rights. Let me say that again, because this is so powerful. The government does not have rights. The people do. The Bill of Rights gives power to the people, not the government. Okay, It restricts the government because our forefathers always knew that the government has a tendency for corruption and for overstepping its bounds, okay? That is the nature of government. Have you all heard about the, there's a bill in at least 23 states that will allow potentially police officers under the Biden administration that will allow police officers and mental health professionals to take away your Second Amendment right if they deem you unfit to own a firearm? Did you hear what I just said? I'm going to be covering that as a separate video, but this is one of the most insane things that my uh, my team and I have uncovered in, in literally, I think it was today. The Biden administration is looking to pass legislation in at least 23 states, as we sit here right now, to allow law enforcement agencies and law enforcement agents, mental health professionals, maybe uh, EMTs, nurses, et cetera, to take away, if they deem you unilaterally, personally, not a judge, not a court, not no criminal conviction, nothing. They simply are like, you know what? I think this person is, in my professional opinion, scratching their head, uh, is deemed unfit to possess a firearm. We're going to take it away. Red flag laws. That's exactly what they're called, Aries. Look them up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I was shocked when I discovered this. I was shocked that red flag laws is now a thing. And peace, fate, that was exactly my thought. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this is the United States of America. Terrifying. But anyway, let's get back to our motion. So the government does not have rights. The government has powers. And those powers are tempered by the rights that are God-given to the people and the Constitution preserved for the people. In contrast, the loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of time unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. That's L. Rod v. Burns, the United States Supreme Court case from 1976. Interveners would suffer irreparable harm were the proposed restrictions endorsed by the court. The Commonwealth is prosecuting journalists and demonstrators alike in its quest to act without criticism. Its authoritarianism has led to people currently facing criminal charges for standing on a street corner holding innocuous signs. That's insane. That's O'Neill versus Canton PD, a case from 2023, November 10th. The government reads uh, the general law 268 that we covered in the previous sign that's in the description below as giving it the power to arrest demonstrators if a potential witness can even see a sign that pertains to the trial. 
By the Commonwealth's reading of the statute, there is literally nowhere that the demonstrators can safely operate, as there are huge roving free speech voids. The Commonwealth should be ordered to limit its application of 13A and 13B only to acts that have the intent and the effect of intimidation, not the expansive reading that it seeks in its motion. Now, 3.5. A complete ban that the government is seeking would delegitimize the proceedings. The public interest favors denial of the Commonwealth's motion and restraining the Commonwealth from abusing sections 13A and 13B, aforementioned. The courts are independent. The people presume that the judge will be free of bias and influence from public opinion. Interveners challenge the Commonwealth's view that this court cannot function if it knows how the public feels about its decisions. Similarly, the court is presumed to be capable of controlling the jury and its courtroom. In United States v. Grace, the Supreme Court held that court decisions are made on the record before them and in accordance with the applicable law. Excuse me. The views of the parties and of others are to be presented by briefs and oral argument. Courts are not subject to lobbying. Judges do not entertain visitors in their chambers for the purpose of urging that cases be resolved one way or another. And they do not and should not respond to parades, picketing, or pressure groups. It is rare that judges and prospective jurors are ignorant of high-profile matters. And frankly, one would hardly think a jury of one's peers includes those who are out of touch with society. Demonstrations show that our system is open and fair. Lockdowns and bans show that we have something to fear. In grace, the government tried to justify, <clears throat> excuse me, a restriction on picketing outside the Supreme Court on the grounds that it might appear to the public that the Supreme Court is subject, is subject, <laughs> it's twice here, is subject to influence by picketers and marchers. Uh, by the way, this is this is a sign to fire whoever is doing the, the second reading. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. Please don't. It happens all the time. I, I, I probably have done that in my motions more time than I can count. Uh, your proofreaders are, are your best friends. Trust me. And sometimes they will miss things too. The Supreme Court rejected the government's desire to protect it from demonstrators. But in doing so, endorsed the notion that a ban... Hi, baby. Hi, Zinni. My cat decided to say hello. Hi, baby. But in doing so, endorsed the notion that a ban on demonstrators would likely send the opposite message. If a crowd... Come on. If a crowd stood outside the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a sign saying, the earth is flat, would it change the minds of the astrophysicists at MIT? Of course not. There would be no harm because there would be no influence. Accordingly, a court with confidence in itself should permit demonstrators. Otherwise, if it banned them for this trial, why not all trials? Is it that there are too many people focused on this trial? Would a single demonstrator outside another trial holding a sign that said Black Lives Matter or judge not lest thee be judged influence the court? And why not? If that one hypothetical person would not change the outcome of this free and fair trial, why would 100 people wearing free Karen Reed shirts engage, excuse me, change the outcome of the trial? The hundreds of protesters against police brutality outside the trial of the police officers who killed uh, Amadou Diallo did not affect a guilty verdict. And the demonstrators here, are, are the demonstrators here more powerful? Is there some talismanic power in this case that does not exist in others? Such power that this court lacks the ability to combat it through constitutionally reverent means? I love the open-ended question without an answer. The, the um, what is it called? The um, rhetorical question. 3.6. Attempts to stifle dissent will have the opposite effect. Oh my God, here it is. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what I have been waiting for. Because when you start to silence people, when you tell people, you know what? You know, remember that First Amendment right that you have? Yeah, we're just going to yoink. It has the opposite effect. It is actually going to send shockwaves through the country. It is going to be imperative on the court not to draw any more attention to this case that it already has. And by granting this motion, I anticipate we're about to read, this is going to send shockwaves through the United States of America all the way to California. Even the most liberal of states in California are probably going to look at this and go, uh, something is rotten. 
Why can't they peacefully protest outside the courthouse? You know what I mean? Oh, my God. This was filed today, for those of you asking. Attempts to stifle dissent will have the opposite effect. The Commonwealth should be careful what it wishes for. Should an order issue that unjustly stifles freedom of expression, liberty finds a way. Dissidents are a scrappy lot. In apartheid South Africa, the government banned newspapers from publishing stories that could call apartheid into disrepute. So newspapers simply published blank newspapers. Their attempts to shut down criticism metastasized into greater criticism. Even those who were not previously drawn to the cause embraced the cause of freedom of expression. That is brilliant. You just start printing blank, blank newspapers. I didn't know that was a thing. That is, that is brilliant. Free Americans make other people fighting for liberty look like amateurs. Since April 19, 1775, we in Massachusetts have been the OGs of liberty. We're the original gangsters, Yana. We're the original gangsters of liberty, Judge. <laughs> Since April 19, 1775, we in Massachusetts have been the original gangsters of liberty. As another rebellion's spokesperson said, the more the Commonwealth tightens its grip, the more liberty will slip through its fingers. It's from Star Wars. Lucasfilm, 1977. The kind of people, I love this, he's a Star Wars man. The kind of people who will travel from miles around to demonstrate outside a trial for months and months will find a way to protest. The Commonwealth asks for a blanket ban on protesting within 500 feet of the courthouse. This would even place the sidewalk in front of the public library off limits. It is foreseeable that there would be protests simply about the lack of a right to protest. Exactly. Because that's what happens when you take away, people find a way. Lisa C., thank you, says the duty of a true patriot is to protect his country from its government. That's Thomas Paine. Exactly. That's exactly right. Hey, Flux. Oh, by the way, we got Flux in the house. Uh, Flux, congratulations on um, 2,000 subscribers, I believe. I believe some... Uh, some congratulations are in order. Is that correct? <laughs> My girlfriend just gave me a thumbs up saying that looks right. Flux has um, just hit 2,000 subscribers. Congratulations, Flux. Good for you. You're welcome, Flux. Thank you for, for stopping by. That's awesome. Good for you. Okay, where were we? Okay, so it is foreseeable that there will be protests simply about the lack of a right to protest. <laughs> um, that's crazy, and, and I completely agree. Now, if we narrow the request to just content or viewpoint-based restrictions and a demonstrator cannot hold up a sign that says Karen Reed, then they may hold up one saying that reading is fundamental. If the Commonwealth bends that, then they will hold up books. If they cannot hold up books, they will find another way. This is not to say that these are reasonable alternative avenues of expression. They are not. But the reaction to a clampdown is rarely silent compliance. Do you all remember what happened when I got my nose dirty in the What the Hales saga with Judge DeThomasis in Levy County, Florida. And I got the voicemail of tell Larry to hashtag buckle up. I didn't say the hashtag part, but he said, tell Larry to buckle up because I'm going to be filing a bar complaint. What did that do? Did that make me go scared and go, oh my God, I don't want to lose my bar license. I'm so scared. I'm I'm just gonna back away. I, I don't want to get involved. This is not this is not my forte. I'm so sorry, you guys. Here, have fun. See you later. I have made 20 videos on that topic since. Megan Fox writer, shout out to you, Megan, has probably made a dozen videos, if not more by now. Tug has made that umbrella guy has made two dozen videos. Um, 
Legally Live has made like a dozen videos. Uh, MG Law has made videos. All they had to do is just leave well enough alone and there'll be two videos out there. But thanks to that voicemail, buckle up, Larry. I'm coming for you with a bar complaint in my hands. There are now probably, probably over a thousand videos on this topic where it could have been just two or three or four. They did it to themselves. That's what happens when you try to stifle speech, when you try to take away a person's right to report, when you try to take away a person's right to speak on a topic. That is, it has the reverse effect. That is a well-known fact. And, and the judge, I'm sure, knows it. This is not going to be a surprise. This is not going to be a surprise. Um, the Commonwealth seeks to blow out the candlelight of liberty. Oh, I love it. And if it, succeed, if it succeeded, it would fan those flames, not extinguish them. It will be a challenge to find jurors who are ignorant enough about this trial to serve on its jury. If the Commonwealth gets its way, it may render that quest impossible completely as they will pour metaphorical gasoline on the small fire of liberty that will otherwise calmly smolder outside the courthouse. Okay. Conclusion, the leave to intervene by the protesters should be granted. If the court is inclined to grant any prior restraint, it should do so with a scalpel rather than with a sledgehammer or the analogy that I used with a um, fly swatter, not a shotgun. By the way, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell if you haven't already. Join on as a member if you're so inclined. Membership started at 99 cents. And if you have questions, super chat me. The court should tread lightly outside the courthouse, and it should make its decisions as circumstances require inside the courthouse. Dated April 2nd, so you know this is fresh. This was submitted today. Mark Rondaza with the Rondaza Law Group. Sir, I salute you. That was one of the most beautiful pieces of work I have read in a long time. Attorney for Interveners on behalf of the people, the Constitution, and liberty. Love it. And, of course, Certificate of Service that it was served upon uh, Michael Morrissey, Alan Jackson, David Yannetti, Counselor for Karen Reed, and Counselor for the Commonwealth. Adam Lally and Michael Morrissey for the Commonwealth. Alan Jackson, Elizabeth Little, David Yann and David Yannetti, excuse me. Counsel for Karen Reed. 21 pages of some of the most beautiful work I have seen in a long time. I mean, that was impressive. That was just beautiful. Um, welcome, Timmy Norfolk, to the channel. Thank you for joining on as a member, brother. Good to see you. He's got some t-shirt ideas he's been populating, so be on the lookout. Timmy, Timmy has got some, Timmy's got the juice. Timmy has got the juice. Um, very exciting stuff. Um, yeah. Wow. Simply, wow. I can't believe that this motion had to be made in the first place. I mean, it's one of those things that you look at it and you go, how on earth did we get here? How on earth have our rights been so eviscerated for so long? How is it possible that we absolutely have to protect our rights in the face of literal destruction of our constitutionally protected rights? Um, it's terrifying. It's just absolutely terrifying that this is how far we've come in the erosion of our constitutional rights. Now, hopefully... When the judge sees this motion, and hey, Alex McAttack, thank you for joining on as a member as well. Um, hopefully, Flux, I agree with you. This case has me heated as well. Hopefully, in about two days' time, when the judge hears this motion, or less than that, 36 hours, I guess, 36, 37 hours, um, they raised... Six thousand dollars in two hours to hire Rondaza. Holy shit, that's impressive. Good for you all. 
that's collective effort right there. If I've ever seen it, um, that's incredible. So hopefully in 37 hours time, uh, the government is going to have their motion denied, hopefully, and the judge will either grant a more narrowly tailored version of their request, maybe in line with what has been um, what has been nothing short of the evisceration of our rights or the attempt thereof, I should say, you know, eight short days ago, attempt by the Commonwealth. Um, people are saying money well spent. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, I'm following this very closely, especially now being a First Amendment, you know, scholar or future scholar, if you will, because I am very much drawn to these issues. It's like, it's like oxygen to me, uh, First Amendment rights and First Amendment litigation. I um, We're getting hired, by the way, on cases from all over the country. I do want to say this real quick. We just got hired on an appeal in Virginia. No, yes, Virginia. And we also got hired on a DUI in Arizona and another case in California. There are people hiring us from all over the country. And it is incredible to like realize how far our firm has come. I mean, I don't know another Kentucky lawyer who currently has active litigation in more than two states. I mean, Kentucky, Indiana, that's easy. You know, you tons of lawyers have litigation, in Kentucky and Indiana, but to have litigation, in Kentucky, Indiana, Virginia, Arizona, uh, California, we also have cases have had cases out of Florida, Tennessee, Ohio, uh, Alaska of all places, Illinois, Ma uh, uh, Michigan. I mean, it's like, it's crazy. We're getting calls from all over the country asking for people to uh, people asking for us to help represent them in the cases that they have uh we do charge a consultation fee non-refundable 250 dollars just to talk to me so you got to pay to play it's not like i'm going to talk to everybody because that would make it completely impossible for me to do my job but if you pay the consultation fee i will 100 speak to you no matter what even if we can't help you um Oh, and Pennsylvania too. Sometimes I can, I, I have information. I can guide you in a way. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be writing things for you for 250 bucks, but uh, there's somebody from Pennsylvania who just recently reached out and is considering uh, retaining us. I forgot about that one. And New York, there's one New York, and I think there's the one guy from New Jersey, but I don't think he's going to hire us. Um, it, it didn't seem like he was inclined towards that. And and the New Mexico fella, I don't think he's going to hire us either. But anyway, we're literally getting calls from everywhere everywhere and it is not something that i foresaw like even five years ago four years ago even three years ago that it would be this insane and i'm very happy and i'm very pleased that we're able to help people all across our great land with various uh issues oh texas I almost forgot the guy from texas because that one is not even a criminal issue it's a civil issue like people are hiring us on things and I'm telling them literally on the phone. I'm like, you understand we've never handled this before, but we'll, we'll give you the best representation money can buy. And they're like, hired, here you go. You know, like, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure. You know, I'll take it. Uh, I'll be happy to assist you in any way that we can. It's just, just we're going to have to learn a new field of law. Uh, hold on one second. Um, yes. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I guess they're just, sorry, we just got some groceries and they just keep knocking on the door. Then just leaving the groceries at the, uh, um, at the door. But anyway, so, I mean, how many States did I already name that we just let alone got calls from and we got retained on, I don't know, 15 cases, 15 States something like that. I mean, that's wild. 
And I'm very happy that we're able to help people. So anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Um, there's one more video coming your way probably in the next 30 minutes or so. I'm doing like, this is the first time I think in my YouTube history that I've done four videos in a 24-hour period uh, on April 2nd. We had the, the fire. If you haven't checked that out, that was cool. Um, I went live in the middle of the night. Then we had uh, the tornado watch, then this video, and the John and Lynette are coming next. So they filed another motion to correct because they're morons. We're going to do that in just a few here. Thank you all for coming. I will see you all in the next video in just a few minutes. Bye, everybody.